those scenes that you just saw are from a, a show called The Chosen that just kind of depicts the life of Jesus, kind of gives us a window into what it, it might have been like to watch him interact with people and, and do his ministry. Uh, so um, I really like that show. Uh, the, they're releasing the first two episodes of the next season in the theaters on Saturday. So I'm going to be there on Saturday to, to see that. But that's just my personal thing. You don't have to like it. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about is greater love. That's why I wanted you to see these, these scenes, because the uh, concept of greater love centers us on the person and work of Jesus Christ. So here's how we talk about greater love here. The love with which God loves you is a greater love than any love you would possibly experience from any other person or thing in the universe. His love is greater. And because of that greater love, the love with which we love God is a greater love than we give to any other person or thing in this universe. And because we have this relationship where we're experiencing this this ultimate level of love from God and we're returning to him the greatest love we can give, then we are equipped now to love other people with a greater love than they would experience from anyone who doesn't have this relationship with God. The love with which we love others is a greater love. And so we're, we are people of greater love. We have this greater love relationship with God, and this is what we demonstrate to others. So for the next two weeks, I just want to talk about what God's love for us looks like, specifically in terms of kindness and generosity, which I believe are very critical for us being able to express and experience greater love. And uh, next week, we'll talk about what it looks like for us to love others with the love uh, that God shows to us. Uh, You ready? You good? With me? Okay. Um, So first, I think we need to define some terms because I think our culture tends to dilute some principles and concepts that we find in scripture. And uh, we find this with words like love. You know, love can mean a lot of different things. Um, You can use it in a lot of different ways, Um, but we want to use it in a very uh, biblical way when we talk about loving God and loving others, which uh, is, I'm going to do what's best for you as God defines best, even if it costs me, right? Right. And so I think the terms kindness and generosity have been diluted by our culture. If you, if you look at uh, movies, uh, read books, engage on social media, or just listen to people talk, kindness often gets boiled down to just being nice, just being, just being a nice person. But, but especially if you're nice to people who don't fit in with your particular group, well, then that's, that's really true. That's, that's kind. That's kindness. Or kindness uh, is um, being nice to animals. Like that, people think of like, if you're nice to animals, you're a kind person. But the only animals we actually care about are the cute ones. I don't know if you've noticed that, but we only care about cute animals. Um, but we don't encourage people. We don't value somebody that's nice to rats. But, but kittens and puppies, yes. Like if you don't like kittens and puppies, you're a monster, but it's normal to not like rats. I don't, I don't know why we do that. It's something in our brains. Um, and, and, or kindness sort of gets boiled down to just kind of smiling at mean or stupid people. Um, like, you know what I mean. Like when you see, see somebody doing something that's just like a knucklehead thing to do or, or, or disrespectful and you, do, and you can just kind of smile and, and turn away, that's kindness. That's sort of our culture. Like if you do all of those things, our culture would say, and you're a really kind person. You should think of yourself as a kind person. But God's way of showing kindness blows that definition of kindness out of the water. God sets a different bar for what it means to be kind. We're going to look at that here in a minute. Same with generosity. I think generosity, the way our culture portrays that, sort of gets boiled down to, like, if you have a little extra and you give it to someone who doesn't have as much as you, that's generous, right? If you have a little egg, you take the extra that you have and you give it to someone who doesn't have as much as you, that's, that's generous. Or if you give extravagant gifts, if you just go over the top for a birthday or an anniversary or a Christmas, or if you just go over the top, then that's generosity. Oh man, the way that God demonstrates generosity blows that definition of generosity out of the water. And so what I want to challenge us to do, I want to give myself and you a little encouraging kick in the rear to not settle for our culture's definitions of kindness and generosity, but to embrace God's. And first, we're going to embrace God's kindness and generosity to us. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus' bar is pretty high. 
He's not talking about being willing to die for someone, right? Because we, we kind of, we have that theor, theoretical, hypothetical question posed, like, you know, would you, who, who would you step in front of a bus for? Who would, who would you, you know, jump in front of a train for? Like, you, you know, your kids, your, you know, your spouse, your parents. Jesus is not talking about that hypothetical. He's talking about literally dying for your friends. Jesus took it a step further and died for his enemies, right? This is the kind of love that produces the kindness and generosity that we experience from God. So let's talk about God's kindness and generosity. Thankfully, we don't have to guess at what kind of God it is that we serve. Yes, he is mysterious. Yes, his ways are above our ways, but he also reveals himself to us pretty clearly. In fact, in this passage in Exodus chapter 34, God offers a description of himself. He tells Moses directly, this is what I'm like. You don't have to guess. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to try to interpret and, and, and do a calculus problem to figure it out. I'm just gonna tell you, this is what I'm like. So let's read what God says about himself. And again, if you see something on the screen that's underlined, those are your lines, and you can read those aloud and in English with us. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. This is a really key passage because God is describing himself. But what we often get stuck on and, uh, and walk away uh, with after reading this is, is that last part where we kind of look at this and say, that's not fair. You know, that's just not fair for God to punish children and grandchildren for the sins of their parents. And, 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 it, and we totally lose the power of the, that first part that talks about God's compassion and, and graciousness and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. And we get hung up on this idea that this is unfair for God to punish children and, and grandchildren for the sins of their parents or grandparents, right? Uh, so what, what is that? Let's just deal with that so we can move on. What, what does that mean? I, I think it doesn't mean that God will punish you for your parents' sins or God will punish my children for my sins. I think it does mean that my sins have consequences. I think we have all experienced in our family history generational sins, things that our family, uh, ways that our family has um, rejected God's authority in some way that has produced sin that has been passed down from generation to generation. And what God is saying is if you reject my forgiveness and grace, I'm not gonna remove the consequences of your sin from your family. I don't believe it means that God punishes children for the sins of their parents because in Ezekiel chapter 18, and you can can look this up, I encourage you to jot that down and look this up, uh, we find really clear uh, explanation that God holds each person responsible for their own sin. He doesn't hold a child responsible for the sins of their parents, but there are consequences to sin. And God allows those consequences to run their course for people who reject his authority um, to define what's good for them. So let's, let's back up now uh, to what God says about himself in the beginning of this, that he is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. This is good news, isn't it? Because I think we all have had moments uh, in our lives, maybe seasons in our lives, maybe our past is full of wickedness and rebellion and sin. And to know that God's love is big enough to offer forgiveness. And that is kindness and generosity. But it's kindness with a purpose. In Romans chapter two, verse four, Paul says, God's kindness is meant to bring us to repentance. God's kindness is for a purpose. It has a plan, and that plan is that we would be transformed into the people that he created us to be. That's, that's what God's kindness and generosity do. They're, they're, they're expressed in forgiveness with an aim toward transformation. What God wants to happen as a result of his kindness and generosity is that we are shaped, we are formed into the image of Christ. 
It is kindness with a purpose. And because it's kindness with a purpose, it means that God doesn't, in his kindness and generosity, affirm all of our choices. I think there is a prevalent idea in culture that love equals affirmation. If you love me, then you will affirm my choices, my lifestyle, my decisions, if you love me. And if you don't affirm my choices, my lifestyle, my decisions, then you don't love me. If you're a parent, that sounds insane, doesn't it? <laughs> like if I take my five-year-old son to the zoo, my sons are not five anymore, they're much older, and uh, they, they, they see the, the wolf exhibit, and they go, Dad, can I go play with the doggies? Like, that's what I want to do. That's the desire of my heart. I see myself as a dog person. And as a dog person, I can't not go play with the dogs. If I love my child, do I affirm their, their choice to step into this environment where they have no idea what they're getting into? Because they can't tell the difference between a dog and a wolf, right? Or it does kindness and generosity mean I protect my children from things that they don't understand, and I guide them away from what is harmful and toward what is helpful. That's, that's the kindness and generosity of God. God's kindness is meant to lead us toward repentance. Because God understands what we don't. God sees what we can't. And God guides and protects us in the direction away from what is harmful and towards what is beneficial. His kindness is kindness with a purpose. And so if we wanna know what that looks like in real life, yes, God says this about himself. What does this look like in real life? Whenever we wanna know what God's characteristics look like in real life, where do we, who do we look to? Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, right? He is God made flesh. So let's hear what Jesus has to say about what greater love and kindness and generosity look like. And then let's see what Jesus does, how he demonstrates this uh, in his ministry. So let's look at Matthew chapter five. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, that it's, a, it's a sermon that Jesus probably preached regularly and Matthew records it here in chapters five through seven. Uh, Jesus says, you have heard it that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Okay, once again, we get to the end of a passage where all we can think of is that last line. And we go, well, if perfection is the standard, <laughs> I'm out. Like, I, I'm out. I, I can disregard everything that came before because I'm not a perfect person. And this is us taking what uh, Matthew says is perfection here and uh, interpreting that as moral perfection. Moral perfection. We, what we think Matthew's saying is, or that Jesus is saying is, that we, we, can't have, we can't sin. We can't make any mistakes. That's perfection, right? But the way that Jesus uses this and, and all of the writers in the New Testament use this word perfect, it's, it's really uh, the word for mature or complete. So what he's talking about is like living into your full potential. This doesn't mean moral perfection. It doesn't mean you never make a mistake or never sin. What Jesus is saying is God always lives up to his full potential, right? God is always expressing his character just as it is. And Jesus says, this is, what we're, this is what we're working toward. We're working toward expressing the character of God, our character as we were created to be, in a mature and full way. And what that involves is loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute you. Jesus said, it's really easy to love people who like you, isn't it? Man, even, even people who don't believe in God, who don't care anything about faith, can love people who are nice to them. Jesus raises the bar and says, what about, what about loving people who actually don't like you? What about loving people who are actively looking to ruin your life? We'll follow up with this more next week, but this is what I want us to focus on today, is this is the love that God shows to us. Scripture says that when we're in our sins, we are enemies of God. 
And, and God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. It's Romans 5.8. God shows us what this looks like. And so Jesus is gonna demonstrate this in his life. If Jesus commands us to do it, he's gonna show us what it looks like. So he does this throughout his ministry. So let's look at one example of that from Matthew chapter nine. Jesus is gonna interact with a tax collector. And so we need to understand what tax collector's role was in uh, Jewish society. Um, They worked for the Roman government. The Roman government collected taxes from the Jewish people and they, they would hire Jewish people to do this. For a Jewish person to accept this job, was to essentially betray their own people because they're going to work for the enemy. And not only just taking a job, but they're taking the job that the people hated the most. Times haven't changed all that much, have they? Tax collector is not the most popular person, right? That's why the IRS is a nameless and faceless group. (laughs) We don't know who they are. They might be here among us. (laughs) Everybody's looking around. But in their culture, this person was a traitor to their own people, and they took the job, what the assumption was, they took the job to get rich, because they were allowed to charge whatever they wanted, they would pay Rome what was required, and they would keep the rest. So they were wealthy, and when they took this job, if their families were good Jewish families, then they disowned the tax collector immediately. They're kicked out of their home. And then they're talked about and referred to as the lowest of the low. So the Jews uh, would talk about in their, in their religious social order, they would talk about uh, the people in categories of their sin. And they would say, there's, there, there's, some, sin, there's some bad stuff out there. There's, there's like prostitution. That's really bad. You, you know, don't, don't do that. But, but lower than that is just like the sinner. There's the, the prostitutes and then there's the sinners. And these are just people whose lifestyle is just against the way of God. And then below that, you got prostitutes, sinners, and then below that is the tax collector. They're just the lowest of the low. And Jesus is going to interact with a tax collector. What is that going to look like? Well, let's, let's see. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. It is probably impossible for us to overstate how shocking this scene would have been in the Jewish community. Not only does Jesus interact with a tax collector, the lowest of the low, the people that, you, if you're a good Jew, you don't, even, you don't even make eye contact with them unless you're gonna tell them how awful they are. But Jesus locks eyes with him and invites him into his family. Like these 12 disciples lived with Jesus. They, they ate their meals together. They, they slept in the same tents or the same places together. Like he invites this tax collector into his family. So I want you to be a part of my family. What is he doing? Not, not only does he do that, then he goes and he sits down to eat with Matthew and his sinner friends. In, in our culture, I mean, we, we eat with all kinds of different people, but mostly we eat with our friends, right? We have meals with our friends. But in Eastern culture, even today, to sit down and share a meal with someone is a public statement of alignment. It's a way of saying, I'm for you and you're for me. It's a way of publicly declaring mutual respect. And so respectable Jews did not sit down to eat with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus does. And not only that, he makes his disciples do it too. <laughs> He's like, hey guys, we're going to Matthew's house. And they're like, the ta- Matthew, the tax collector, we're going to his house? Like, are we gonna preach at him? What are we doing? Now we're gonna eat with him. Oh man, that's a terrible idea. I like how Jesus says it in The Chosen. The guys go, this, Jesus, this is just different. And he says, get used to different. <laughs> this is what we're doing. We're doing different, Right? This is how Jesus demonstrates the kindness and generosity of God. He looks at people that everyone else despises and says, you are invited. You're invited. Can you imagine what this did for Matthew? If we think of God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance, what impact did this have? How was this transformational for Matthew? Well, who wrote this that we are reading from. 
Matthew, he writes his own story. He puts his own story in here. And then he remembers back and he remembers what Jesus said when people reacted to this act of kindness. Let's pick up with verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Matthew is remembering back to Jesus responding. People are saying, why would you eat with this loser, Matthew? And Jesus says, I'm I'm here for the sick. I'm here for the the sinners. And Matthew knows, oh, he's talking about me. (laughs) I'm sick. I'm a sinner. What does a sick person need? They need healing. What does a sinner need? They need forgiveness and grace. And Matthew knows that was me. I was sick and I needed healing. I was a sinner and I needed forgiveness and grace. And when he got it, it changed him forever. He goes from having this job where he sold out his people and walked away from his family and probably gotten rich in the process. And he walks away from all of it to be in Jesus' family. Man, do you think he was transformed by the kindness and generosity of Jesus? Without a doubt. That's what his kindness is for. It's kindness with a purpose. Has God been kind to you? It's for a purpose. It's not, it's not just so that you'll, you'll have warm and fuzzy feelings, although I, I have those sometimes, singing raise a hallelujah with my church family, but it's deeper than that. It's to change me. It's to shape me. So I need to ask myself this question, and I want to invite you in. What does it look like for us to receive the kindness and generosity of God? If we know that it's for a purpose, if we know that it's to change us, what does it look like for us to receive that? So here's what I want you to think about. Think about a time in your life where you wanted something and didn't get it. And looking back, you see the kindness of God. Or maybe you didn't want something to happen and it happened. And looking back, you can see the kindness of God. Let me give you a few scenarios to think through that may or may not relate to you or someone you care about. Maybe at some point in your life, you had a secret sin and you just hoped against hope against hope that no one ever found out. And someone found out. And it was painful. And it broke relationships. And maybe it led to repentance and forgiveness and healing. And you look back and you see the kindness of God. Maybe. Maybe you were comfortably on the fringe of a group, like a church or a group of believers, and you were happy just to be sort of on the outside looking in, just to show up every now and then and watch, observe. But there was this really annoying person who wouldn't leave you alone and kept inviting you deeper in. Oh, come to our group, get involved, serve, be more consistent. And it drove you nuts. And you finally gave in. And you got involved, you got connected, you became more vulnerable, and you look back at that annoying, pesky person, and you see the kindness of God. Maybe there was a moment when you had a need. Maybe it was a financial need, or some other kind of need that you just, you just don't like asking for help. You don't like to be the one who needs something. So you didn't tell anybody, and you weren't going to. You're just going to figure it out. I'll just figure it out. I'm a grown-up. I can make this happen. And somebody who cares about you stuck their nose in your business and found out about your need. And they organized some friends or they brought it to the church family and your need was taken care of. And you look back at that nosy person that stuck their nose in your business and you see the kindness of God. Here's what I hope we can interpret from all of that is that those moments when we wanted something and didn't get it, or we didn't want something and we got it, and we can see the kindness of God that maybe, 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 the next time we really want something and don't get it, 
or the next time we want, we don't want something and we do get it, maybe our eyes should be open to how the kindness and generosity of God are at work in that. Not causing your pain, but being present in your pain. And it's there for a reason. It's there to transform you and to change you. What does it look like for us to receive the kindness and generosity of God? First, uh, just two suggestions, then we'll wrap up. First, uh, live like what he says about you is true. What, What is it that God says about you? Well, first, God says you are loved. 1 John 3, 1, how great is the love, greater love. The Father has lavished on us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. And that is what you are. You are loved. Second, you are forgiven. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and forgives us and purifies us from all our unrighteousness. You are loved and you are forgiven and you are family. You are family. Let's go back to 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called what? Sons and daughters of God. He has adopted you into his family. He, he made you family on purpose. The rest of your family, you didn't get to choose them. You're looking around going, yeah, I didn't, I didn't sign up for this, right? But God chose you, put you in his family on purpose. You are loved, you are forgiven, you are family. Live like it. What, how would it change your approach to your day tomorrow if you woke up on a Monday morning freezing cold, but you know down deep that you are loved, you are forgiven, and you are family? I mean, it shapes our interactions with other people. Suddenly, people don't seem to have as much power to hurt us. Suddenly, circumstances don't have as much power to bring us down because we're loved, we're forgiven, we're family. So just live like what he says about you is true. And second, let it change you. Allow God's kindness to actually change you. So in order for us to do that, we have to trust that his way is best. I think this is a difficult thing, and I think this is part of the, the fall, Adam and Eve's original sin, to take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had said, here's the one thing I'm going to hold back from you and keep for myself is the authority to decide what's good, what's right, and what's wrong. And they took, they wanted that authority for themselves. And I think we repeat that over and over again in our lives. We have some area of our life where we've segmented it off, we've compartmentalized it and said, God, in this area... I want to be in charge. I want to be the one who decides what's good, what's right and wrong for me. And so part of receiving the kindness and generosity of God, allowing it to change us, is to trust that God's way is best. He knows. He knows how we're supposed to operate as human beings because he made us. He knows what's best for us. He knows that what's best for our community is for us to live a certain kind of way. And our job is to trust that. And when we trust it, it changes us. Second, we got to believe that change is possible. I think uh, in some parts of our lives, we've sort of just embraced this idea, well, this is just who I am. I'm grumpy and mean in the morning. Deal with it. I'll feel better after, I'll be nicer after coffee, right? And we say, I'm just going to be mean in the morning. Well, no, you don't, that's not who you are. You could be different. God can shape you. He can transform you. And I think some of us just, we just have this thing built in us where we go like, well, this is how I've always been. This is how I'm always going to be. It's just a character flaw. Just get used to it. And God's going, no, I can fix that. (laughs) And his kindness and generosity to us are intended to shape us and transform us. And we got to believe that he can. If he can change Matthew, who betrayed his own people to have a higher paying job, and, and make him a servant of Jesus? I mean, he can change your grumpiness in the morning, right? And finally, we, we have to have the courage to move away from some unhealthy practices towards some healthy practices. This is what repentance really means. Repentance is about changing something, like I'm gonna do something different. Repentance is saying, yeah, God, I have, been, I have been reaching just like Adam and Eve. I've been reaching for the authority to define good and evil for myself. I'm gonna quit that. I'm gonna knock that off. I, I'm gonna let you define what's good and I'm going to trust that your way is best, and I'm I'm going to look at my life. Where in my life do I see practices that indicate I want to be in charge? I want to be in charge of my money. I want to be in charge of my calendar. I want to be in charge of, of, of who gets my kindness and generosity. And God goes, you know what? 
it would actually be better if you would let me be in charge of those things. <laughs> and repentance is saying, all right, I'm going to change some practices and I'm going to let God be in charge. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to let him have the authority to decide. I, th- I think the, the life that we are created for, a life of peace and joy and purpose, is attainable when we receive the kindness and generosity of God and let it lead us to repentance, to laying down our way and submitting to his way. And so I just want to invite us to to pray through that this morning. Would you stand? And and let's just go before God with this prayer. Where, Where in my life, God, do I need to let your kindness and generosity change me? where I just need to receive it, to to believe without a shadow of a doubt that you love me, you've forgiven me, you've invited me into your family, and to let that truth penetrate deep enough to actually shape me. Let's just bring that prayer before the Father this morning. God, we thank you so much for Jesus, the way that he speaks your character and demonstrates it for us in a way that we can understand and we can embrace And my prayer this morning, Father, is that we would receive your kindness and generosity the way that Matthew, the tax collector, received it and was changed by it, that we would acknowledge we are the ones who are sick. We are the sinners who need Jesus's grace and forgiveness. Would you help us to embrace what you say about us, that we are loved and forgiven and family? And God, would would you shape us through the power of your Holy Spirit to be the people that you created us to be? And may we see greater peace and joy and purpose on the other side. All for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.